Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight, which is a stressful night for us in the United States, but hopefully we will have news on the presidential election results in the next few days. I'm absolutely overjoyed to be able to welcome the phenomenal artist Skawanati as our speaker tonight. And first I'll introduce myself, the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Indigenous Technology Series. My name is Abigail DeCosnick, and I am the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. And I'm also an associate professor in BCNM and in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chechenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the confederated villages of Lashan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. Tonight's event is part of BCNM's Indigenous Technologies Program, which engages questions of technology and new media in relation to global structures of indigeneity, settler colonialism, and genocide in the 21st century. Our Indigenous tech events and ongoing conversations with Indigenous scholars and communities aim to critically envision and reimagine what a more just and sustainable technological future can look like. Behind me, you can see our Indigenous Technologies logo designed by artist Victoria Montano, AKA Creative Madafaka. I'm also going to ask the fabulous staff members, Lara Wolf and Sophia Hussein, to please post in the chat the links to our Indigenous Tech webpage and to our ever evolving Indigenous Tech syllabus, and also to Creative Madafaka's in Instagram account. I'd also like to thank Lara and Sophia and our student staff members for all of their great work for tonight's events and all of our programs, and especially thank our Indigenous Technologies Coordinator, Dr. Marcelo Garzo Montalvo, who is also a visiting assistant professor of Latinx studies at Harvard University for recommending that we invite tonight's amazing speaker, whom it is now my great pleasure to introduce. Born in Kanawake Mohawk Territory, Skawanati belongs to the Turtle Clan. She holds a BFA from Concordia University in Montreal, where she is based. She is co-director of Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or ABTEC, a research creation collective who investigate and create indigenous virtual environments. Their skins, workshops, and Aboriginal storytelling and experimental digital media are aimed at empowering youth. In 2015, they launched IIF, the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Her work has been widely presented in both group exhibitions and solo shows and is included in public and private collections, such as the National Gallery of Canada and the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montreal. She was recently named one of the 2020 Smithsonian Artist Research Fellows and was the subject of a Vogue magazine feature on her clothing design inspired by her avatars. I recently, I recently taught Skawanati's Time Traveler TM Machinima series in my undergraduate course, Transforming Tech, and I promise you that it is one of the most beautiful, profound, hilarious, and important pieces of new media art ever made. It works at every level, teaching crucially important indigenous history and cultural memory and offering indigenous perspectives on and versions of fashion, activism, technology, and futurity, all in the genre of action-packed, romance and comedy-filled, thoughtful and critical science fiction. Her work is absolutely phenomenal. Please join me from your homes in welcoming Skawanati. Hi everyone, wow. Thank you for that amazing introduction. And um, thank you especially also for just having me and hosting me. I would like to thank you Sophia Hussein and Lara Wolf for all the back and forth that we've done over the months and months that this has been planned. Thank you Abigail so much. Thank you Marcelo for, for thinking of me. I really appreciate it. Now we're going to uh, share my screen because I have 
you know, a screen to share. Hmm. And now? Success. Okay, good. Okay, great. <laughs> so, sego sego guego. It's wonderful to be here. Well, it's wonderful to be in my house here in Jojage, which is uh, Mohawk territory, actually. My own, my very own territory. My people live across the river, uh, not too far away. Um, but uh, I was very excited to be invited by UC Berkeley, because famous UC Berkeley, but also I spent a little bit of time in San Francisco and I have a few friends uh, in the area and hopefully I think they might even be listening tonight and hi, I love you. So um, it was just very exciting to be invited to this. I'm also excited, of course, about the idea of participating in a series called Indigenous Technology and that focus. Um, and my talk tonight is called World Rebuilding Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. So I'm going to talk a bit about myself and my role. I'm going to sort of expand upon the bio that Gail just um, just told you about or read to you and um, show you a bit of my work, uh, my work, all my work as an artist and as the co-director of Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace. And I wanted to say one other thing, which is um, I love the topic of Indigenous tech and thinking about what that might mean. I think that what I've been doing and we've been doing is kind of indigenizing tech, if you will, um, because uh, my partner, I'm going to mention him a lot, my husband, actually, Jason Edward Lewis, who is the co-founder with me of, of AbTech, uh, we talk about that a lot and we talk about sort of the, the stuff I've been doing is sort of indigenizing technology that's already there and what he's interested in doing is building it from the ground up and starting with with indigenous languages of an indigenous programming language thinking about it from that way so I just wanted to mention that that's uh, that's something that uh, you should maybe yeah that's a that's another way of talking about it okay so let us let us start oh Hey, another little wine. So this is a bit about me. I um, I show this slide because even if I'm presenting right here in Montreal in my territory, a lot of people don't actually know what um, the structure of Iroquois society is, and so it's just a little, a little way of how I situate myself and how um, how it works around here. An individual is born into a clan, and I'm the Turtle Clan, and then of course the clan is. There's several clans in a community. Our community just has three. Um, the other two are bear and wolf. Um, and my community or in, you know, community band or tribe. Actually, I'm not sure if tribe is the right word. That's Americans use that. And I think it might be for the whole nation. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, is Gahnawage. And then my nation is Ganyange Haga, you know, which is how we call ourselves, but used to be, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the term Mohawk. And then Another thing that people don't realize is that the Mohawk are just one of six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. And we're now calling ourselves again, the Haudenosaunee, which is actually an Onondaga word, uh, the Onondaga word for the people of the Longhouse, our Confederacy. Um, sometimes my bio says that I make my art from the perspective of an urban indigenous woman and a, a cyberpunk avatar. So this is her, her name's XOX. And um, I wanted you to see uh, what I look like, uh, what I, how I think of myself and what I, how I show myself and represent myself in cyberspace. This is the AdTech logo. Uh, and um, you already mentioned what AdTech is all about. So I'll just, I'll, or you, yeah, you gave the great, the perfect line about what it is. So yeah, we're talking about Aboriginal territories in cyberspace. What is cyberspace anyhow? This is what I think it is, software, websites, video games, apps, virtual worlds, machinima, augmented reality, and the list keeps growing. It's all those places that we go to without these physical bodies or the other spaces that we seem to be able to access through technology. Yeah, through technology, I'll say, even though, of course, we know technology is more than that. <laughs> the Initiative for Indigenous Futures um, is also a, a research network where AbTech is a, a network of individuals, IF is a network of institutions. Um, the institutions are spread out across this land known as Canada. And um, 
I don't think I need to read you the whole map, but uh, basically we are, they're small and large uh, organizations. We have uh, one tiny three person <laughs> organization in Ghana Sadage, our sister reserve. And then we have, you know, the University of British Columbia at Okanagan down on the other, on the other end of the scale. And so all of us are working towards these four, um, well, the main idea is making sure indigenous people are in the future. And so uh, one of the things that um, I've thought about for a while, or I noticed at a certain point, so yes, I'm a sci-fi fan. I have been such a fan since I was a little girl, actually. But it took me a long time to realize that most of the sci-fi I had read, there were no native people in there. And I was like, and there are no brown people almost either. And so I started to think that that was not really very good at all. I thought that perhaps even that could be linked to the fact that Native people in Canada, and I think the United States as well, have the highest dropout rate, the highest incarceration rate, and the highest suicide rate still. And I thought, geez, could that be because we don't see ourselves in the future? Hmm. And so, you know, as you also probably know, Native people are often not only are we thought of as living in the past, but we are used as literary devices <laughs> as to represent the past. Um, and so I, I thought that that needed to end. So um, I, I myself have done personal work, which I'm going to show you in a bit, but uh, we wanted to, we wanted more people to do that. So Jason and I, uh, started, well, Jason is a professor at Concordia University, and so he has access to these amazing funding bodies, including the SHRC, it's short for Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And um, together we, we started this program, if you will. Uh, I take, it could take an hour just talking about that whole journey, so I'm trying to keep it short. But um, yeah, we wanted to just have other people come on in and, and play with that idea and not just artists either. We wanted all kinds of people, thinkers and academics. So we have the Skins Workshops, which I'm gonna tell you more about. We have residencies of the, on the Future Imaginary in which we invite artists and other people too. Like I said, not just artists, but like we wanna have a food sovereigntist perhaps come and create something, create a plan. What is the meal of the future? Can we grow it? Can we cook it? What can we do? That kind of thing. Um, we also put on symposia almost every year. It hasn't been quite that way, and uh, especially this year. And we do an Aboriginal New Media Arts Archive. So I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, of that work that we're doing. Oh yes, but first I'm going to go back, back, rewind to the past and let you know an origin, part of our origin story. If I was in a room with you, I would ask for a show of hands to know who here remembers the palace.com. <laughs> Most, yeah, it depends, it dep you know, it's pretty rare that people remember this, uh, this technology, which was cutting edge back in 1997 when I first discovered it. It was the first um, virtual space that I entered. It was the place where I learned the term avatar and what you're, so what you're seeing here on the screen is um, our avatars. The default avatar was the smiley face. And what was special about this place is it was visual chat software. So back then, you know, it's hard when you're talking to young people that this is like, so it's so obvious, but you know, we were doing this thing called chatting, <laughs> which we, you know, every day do now all the time when we're, we're texting, but, this was really amazing to be able to chat with someone computer to computer via the modem in real time. You could send this text message and the person would answer immediately. <laughs> and it was really amazing. And the, for some reason, the, um, the way it was the, um, forgetting the word, but basically you would open up a room for, I don't know why it was called a room, but you would open up a room to be able to talk with someone in this room. And so, when the palace people developed this ver this graphical visual version, you had a series of rooms. And so of course it made sense that it was called the palace because there are all these different rooms, even though it's very imperial sounding and people have asked me, why would a native person use a technology called the palace? But I thought it was awesome. The main thing I loved about it was how customizable it was. 
And eventually you were able to create your own palace. And so I did that and I created Cyber Pow Wow. And we created all these different rooms, some very simple. We created our own avatars. Here's me as XOX back then wearing, uh, wearing the Lori Petty tank girl avatar. <laughs> Um, and we had this wonderful event in which I invited artists to help me create a palace and also talk about art, talk about technology, talk about being an indigenous person making digital art. You know, people were like, is that even a thing? Are you even allowed as an indigenous person? You know, of course, we will, the answer was yes. Um, but we, we had an experience that, uh, that really shaped what came to be, which was that so at first, before we ever used, before I made my own palace, we had a meeting in this palace, the main palace, you know, and you see all these other people all around and that was, that seemed, I thought that would be fine, but we are here, we are trying to have a serious conversation with our little smiley faces. And there was a person there who was clearly an advanced user and they had created a script that was called Zap. And what they could do is they could type, type Zap XOX and then suddenly there would be like this, lightning bolt attached to me from that person and I was unable to move or speak and later debriefing you know that was a, it was a major pain and was really hindering our conversation and so we decided to make our own palace and we because we realized we needed a safe space even on the internet to be who we are we need to be able to run our own space um cyber power continued uh uh, had a bunch of iterations from 97 to 2004. And we think of, Ab and that's where the name Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace came from. It's, an, we, you know, cyber, ter uh, cyber power was an Aboriginally determined territory in cyberspace. In 2001, that was about, that was when I made my first artwork in which I thought of, in which I seriously wanted to think about Indigenous people in the future. And so I created this character. Her name is Gadzitsa Hawi Kapozo. I created a timeline of 10, 10 events, a timeline of 1,000 years. So yes, I should say that this was a commissioned piece in the new, for the new millennium. In Canada, there was a lot of money for, uh, for artists, uh, for artworks uh, to celebrate and to mark the new millennium. Excuse me. Uh, and so I wanted to have a millennium artwork and I created this timeline of one millennium of First Nations history. But the timeline started in 1490, two years before Columbus came to Turtle Island, and ended in 2490. So I had some history, some history that took place in the future. Um, and so, yeah, I created uh, this character. She wears these different outfits. There's an outfit for each of the, there's a date in each century that you can visit, and you visit it by basically having an outfit and reading her journal entry. Um, and this site is still online. You can go take a look at it. That's all I'm going to say about her for the moment. But oh, so yeah, actually, I want to say that, you know, so she visits different uh, characters like that I found in science fiction, the few characters that I found in science fiction that were native, like Chakotay uh, from Star Trek Voyager, and then Raven, who is the antagonist, the bad guy in Neil, Stavin Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. But she also goes to, uh, she goes to visit Pocahontas in 1615. And uh, here she's wearing what she wears to the intergalactic powwow. And part of why I show you this is because this research that I did doing, doing this project comes up for me again in Time Traveler TM. This whole project, this whole uh, presentation is not necessarily chronological. I end up going out of order a lot, but you know, there are some dates that stick with me. So around 2006, somebody showed me Second Life. And I believe it was Celia Pierce from, uh, who is a game uh, scholar. And I, uh, so I, here I am looking at Second Life and I'm like, it's the palace all grown up. Instead of these little smiley faces, I now have an entire body. And what a body I have. And I can walk, I can run and I can fly. And I can make things. I can customize it just like the palace. So I mean, I just naturally gravitated toward it. Now, going back, uh, thinking back about another reason I was very interested in Second Life is that somebody, um, so I should say, I said I was not going to say much about it, but 
When I made Imagining Indians in the 25th century, my intention was not to just have one character. No, I wanted four characters, each of them having 10 outfits and they would interact and there'd be, you know, there was like, that was my thought that there would be this gigantic thing. And someone was like, Scavenati, keep it simple, stupid, which is always the right answer, FYI. <laughs> so anyway, I still had this character in mind, this sort of male character. I, I want to make this brother piece to imagining Indians in the 25th century. And I wanted to explore the future more. I didn't feel I had explored it fully or enough for myself in this piece. So I was also thinking, okay, yes, I had had this person say to me, oh, imagining Indians is such a girl piece. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, well, come on, paper dolls, journaling. And I was like, okay, okay, right. Well, that's girl activity, okay. Um, all right, so I fell into the trap and I'm like, okay, well, what's boy, what do boys do, you know? So I was like, video games. But nobody was making anything that looked like a video game back then. I mean, you had to be a 3D animator already if you wanted to do something like that. So I was like looking for, I was looking for something exactly like Second Life. I was, you know, and when Celia said, oh yeah, and I think you can make movies. I think you make these things called machinimas in Second Life, I was like, okay, I got to do this. And so that's how Time Traveler TM came about. So Time Traveler TM, well, I'll let you tell, I'll let you hear the story for yourself. It's a machinima, which is a movie filmed in a virtual environment. And um, I have made nine episodes and it took me seven years to make those nine episodes. And you're going to see the first one, which looks like it came from another era. But uh, I really appreciate your kind words, Gail, because I still love it. So <laughs> I'm going to play it for you. I'm going to play you just uh, a little bit more than two minutes from the very first episode, and it sets up the intro. And then I'll continue the story uh, when, I, when I rejoin you. So we tested this earlier. Hopefully, like before, it will work with uh, sound and everything. And if I just had a mouse, a mouse to, <laughs> to make it play. <laughs> That would be so wonderful. All right. My name is Redoris Steerhouse. Redoris means hunter in Mohawk. That's what people call me, hunter. I'm a Mohawk, not a Mohican, okay? We survived. Like my father and my father's father, I can use a bow and arrow like nobody's business. I can also paddle a canoe faster than most people's and more quietly than your mother's orgasm. And like the legends say, I can walk the high steel without a worry. Hell, I can do gymnastics up there. All these traditional skills would have made me one serious breadwinner once, a couple of hundred years ago, when us Indians still made up the majority of Turtle Island. But today, in an overmediated, hyper consumerist North America without enough room for everybody, I have to be content with being a ruthless, efficient, cold blooded killer. That pisses me off. Okay, cold blooded killer is not exactly the politically correct term for what I do. Bounty hunter sounds better. Hired gun also works, though it lacks sophistication. I did spend some time in the Marine Corps, also like most of my relatives. But you know, fighting other people's wars is starting to get boring. I'm thinking maybe I need a new aim in life. Screen, on. Traveling through time these days is easy, thanks to Time Traveler TM. Witness important historical events or interact with the people who made them happen. You can even customize your own events and visit with your great 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 grandmother. All customized characters must have existed. It's easy and fun. Visit www.timetravelertm.com. <laughs> I'm Traveler TM, on. Yeah, they use these in schools for history class. It takes all the known facts about a particular event in history, a speech, a battle, a day in the life of, 
and recreates it for you in living color. It's basically like going into a full-on 3D chat room and hanging out with famous dead people, like Geronimo. I'm interested in a little hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's one of my specialties. So, let's try Indian and Massacre. More than 86,000 hits, but most of them talk about Indians being massacred. I want to know about Indians who are doing some massacring. Let me try the trusty random function. Figure odds are good that I'll get to see some good old-fashioned killing, at least. I figure a little visiting with my ancestors, a little recon with my role models, could do me some good right now. Give me a new perspective. Go ahead. Call it a vision quest. So that's what Time Traveler Jam looks like in, in its first uh, episode. Thank you. And what happens is uh, Hunter goes on to continue using his edutainment system to find out more about his own, his own heritage. And along the way, he meets a woman from our time, Dora Kuhawi, and they fall in love. And just to get quite right to the end, the big thing that happens is she chooses to live with him in the future. So sorry, I forgot to tell you, she gets a pair of the glasses and they have a weird glitch. And so for some reason, she can use the glasses to actually time travel, whereas Hunter's not really time traveling, right? But so yeah, so like he invites her to come and live with him in the future. And so, and she chooses the future. And that sort of the significance of that part with a lot of interesting stops along the way, I like to think. Okay, so I, I'm, I think that's, I was trying to put this talk in chronological order and that's why I started doing like my work and now I'm back here to talk a little bit about Initiative for Indigenous Futures work. So I want to tell you about the Skins Workshop. So, all right, one thing, there's one thing, you know, science fiction is the future, but really the future is, it's true. Like Whitney said, our children, right? The youth. So we wanted to uh, work with young people and empower them to not just be consumers of technology, but also producers. We wanted them to feel like they were allowed to be both indigenous and techie, you know, because I, I mean, that sort of a recurring theme, you know, people just, there's this awful, sometimes this uh, expectation that you're not fully authentically native if you like certain things like technology. <laughs> and so, um, I really, we really wanted to help uh, get rid of that, that feeling or that, that stereotype, I guess you could say. And so, yeah, we, what we've been doing is teaching uh, young people how to make video games. So we call, and other technology as well. Basically we call it um, Skins Aboriginal Storytelling and Experimental Digital Media Workshops. And we've done a whole bunch of them. The first one, so in the first, at first, we really were imagining that the young people would um, make a game based on a traditional story, like a legend or a, a very far history. And, you know, since I guess partly since that was our expectation, that is exactly what they did. And that was wonderful. Odzi, Rise of the Ganyan Gehaga Legends is our first, our first game. Then we had the Adventures of Skyumuri, also bringing to life a, a legend from, uh, from the past. And suddenly I started to think about what we were doing there. Like, sure, it's great and to bring an old story into a new technology and transmediate it. That's wonderful. But these, I wanted these people to feel like their stories were, were good enough. You know, the stories of their own life were still native stories. And so um, I started talking a bit about that in our workshops. And hmm, what a surprise in the next, uh, in the next workshop, it's a story, a contemporary story of a young woman who goes to university, Yayande, and uh, is, goes, uh, has a degree in archaeology, and the bad guy, I'm going to give it away, turns out to be her archaeology teacher who wants to steal a precious piece of uh, historical cultural artifact from our people, which is the, you know, the peacemakers wampum. So uh, that was very exciting. And so we started talking a little bit more about that. And uh, in one of our most recent uh, workshops, uh, well, it takes place in outer space. And I'm gonna show you a quick little video that uh, was made. Uh, so I should, I wanna set this up a little bit. Um, 
we uh, have been so lucky and feel so excited that uh, these workshops have gone beyond uh, where we thought they would be. We started in my community of Gunnawage and we, I always dreamed that they might ripple out and, and they did further than I ever imagined. We were invited to go to Hawaii uh, Kaneokana, the, uh, the um, sort of school district, I'm so sorry if I'm saying it wrong, I've forgotten the name, <laughs> but basically um, they invited us to come and work with their youth and uh, it was very exciting. We, we did that and I think this video might tell you everything else you need to know and if not, I'll let you know. So yes, Kaneokana made this beautiful video and we um, we brought a big team of, uh, oh my gosh, can't remember me, but say 10 to 15 instructors and we brought our elder with us and um, worked for three weeks with, uh, with these young people, first teaching them the basics, first doing storytelling for the first almost, for the first few days, then teaching them the basics in, um, in game design like actually unity and uh, you know different programs different 3d modeling um how to make a cutscene, and then we went into did five days of game production we also teach um machinima which is you know what you just saw i love to teach that to young people as well there's me a long time ago with the youth and uh some of the machinimas we've made with the youth are you can watch also on our website. Here's the modem made with the Native Youth Program at UBC in British Columbia. And this is another one. They did, there was two teams there. We've also made How the Loon Got Its Walk with our partner, the Mackenzie Art Gallery in 2018. And another thing that we're doing uh, for the youth, but other people as well, is um, the place where I make all my movies is, is in Second Life. It's our own island. We call it Aptek Island. And, uh, you know, it was, it had two purposes. One was to build the sets for my movies, but like the other was as I wanted it to be a community gathering space. But you know what? Nobody was showing up. And I was like, <laughs> what can we do to help, you know, to, to bring this along? So we thought of doing we thought of having activating Arctic Island. And basically what that is, is people would show up. So we, we actually, we thought no one was showing up. And then we wrote this little script and we found out that people were coming, but they were just coming at all these different times and they were showing up and there was nobody there. And then they, I guess they just left. 
So we thought, what if we set up a, a weekly time where everyone is, where somebody is always in world and you know, people can come and then they can chat, they can have a tour, maybe they can learn stuff that they've learned, you know, build on the skills they, some of the people who've taken workshops have learned. And so that's what we've done. And I just want to invite everyone here to come visit Aptic Island if you like. The instructions for how to get there are at the bottom of this screen. Just, you can go to www.abtech.land. And uh, yeah, that's just like a little meeting, a little impromptu meeting that happened in, in Second Life, which I was gonna tell you about, but I won't have time to finish my whole talk if I do. So I'm gonna skip it. You can, if you're really interested, ask me later. Okay, residencies. I told you a bit about them already, and I wanted to just tell you some of the artists that did and what they did very briefly. Scott Benesina Bandon is an Anishinaabe artist who made Blueberry Pie Under the Martian Sky, which was a virtual um, reality piece, which is an amazing story of like a future story again, where uh, a fulfillment of an Anishinaabe prophecy in which uh, they said that uh, they say that their people came to earth from the stars, but that one day they were going to go back and they're going to be led by a little boy. And so this, uh, when you do this VR, you're on that journey going back to the place where your ancestors came from. Post Commodity did a project called Each Branch Determined, also imagining a future. When you enter this, we're also a VR, when you enter this uh, world, it's like you enter in this fire and what you think you're seeing is like this horrible post-apocalyptic landscape. But actually, as you get through it, you start to understand that the land is being managed in the traditional ways that their people manage them before contact. And it's bringing, bringing back uh, Sustain, you know, it's a sustainable practice and it's bringing back a healthy landscape. We've also uh, commissioned artists to just make singular images of the future. And so I'm just gonna show you a couple here. Jeffrey Varege's Bold Steps, which is gorgeous, gorgeous indigenous astronaut. Ray Kaplan made Hunter of the Altered Game, him imagining a, a more dystopic future where the animals have mutated and have uh, more than two eyes um, and people have to hunt for their food, which maybe is not that bad, I don't know. But uh, we also have Connor Peon's work in this uh, collection. We've made these into postcards and we've also shown these in galleries by projecting them really large. So there's like a whole, it's, I love how there's all these different ways to show this work. Okay, and so now we flip back over to a couple more machinimas that I made. Um, uh, I made these all the way in 2016 and 2017. She Falls for Ages is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee creation story. Now, if you know that story, which many people don't, there's many versions. But what's, co what's common to, um, to all the versions is it takes place in a place called Sky World, which is always said, talked about as being above the heavens. There's always a tree, a special tree, which gets uprooted, leaving a hole through which a pregnant woman falls. And she lands on an earth that is still covered with water. Um, and that's, that's the basic. And there's actually an epic, you know, version, there's versions that show, talk about her youth. There's versions that talk about her, you know, her descendants. And I'm going to show, tell you about my next machinima that was made just six months later called The Peacemaker Returns. And The Peacemaker Returns, where She Falls for Ages was a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee creation story. Peacemaker Returns is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee confederation story. So the story of how those, those five, those original five tribes or nations they were at war with one another. And we had this great guy come and tell us how to, how to love each other. So I want to tell that story. And I want to uh, tell you that this was um, a really exciting work for me to do because I was invited by Vox, Centre des Démarches Contemporains here in Montreal. And they wanted me to do a show specifically for children. And I was like, kids won't like my stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. Kids love my stuff because they think it's cartoons. But so I said, you know, yeah, no problem. I'll just take out all the nudity and swearing and I should be fine. 
Um, and they also, but they were like, okay, well, we don't just want a machinima, we want a whole exhibition. And so we thought about where could we put the, you know, perhaps what we could do is create an area where the children would sit and watch it. And so they had these cute little, little cushions that the kids could sit on inside this longhouse of the future. What you can't see in this image, and unfortunately I didn't add an image of it, is I created all these wampum belts. Some are reproductions of historical wampum belts and some are wampum belts of the future. And so altogether, uh, it created a, a nice show, I think. And what I'm gonna show you now is my very first trailer that I made. So it's a trailer from Peacemaker Returns and it's also about two minutes long. And I promise, well, actually, I guess I can't promise you, but I think you'll be able to see the whole thing. If I have a mouse again. My name is Yodet Sa'a, and I live on Earth, usually. Until recently, life on Earth had been very good. The goal of our mission is to create a union been invited on this historic voyage because I have a special power. I'm a dreamer. I see the past perfectly. Just look. I think the ending's really long. Okay. okay. And so now I'm going to, this is the last project I'm going to share with you. It's my most recent project called Calico and Camouflage. Yeah, it's the one that was featured in Vogue. <laughs> and so um, I. I was invited to, in 2018, I was invited to go to Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto. And man, was I thrilled. I did not know anybody at Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto would have, you know, would know anything about my work. Um, and I didn't even think of myself as having anything to do with fashion. But, you know, I have been designing costumes for avatars for like a long time. Uh, and so that's what they wanted me to talk about. And I was really happy to go and do that. While I was there, I saw a fashion show. Now I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting. I was expecting beautiful indigenous clothing for sure, but I was expecting, you know, skinny models looking angry on a runway. <laughs> but actually what there were, were all kinds of models, all ages and colors and genders and what else are there, all the things. <laughs> and they were smiling and it was so wonderful. And I thought, I wanna do that. I have, I have been thinking about this idea for a long time, the idea I will show you, but you know, I thought I'll make costumes for my avatars. I will make a fashion show in Second Life and I'll just film it. It'll be a machinima fashion show. Um, and so I did that. And I, as I was thinking more about, so what the idea is, we have regalia among the Haudenosaunee and other people as well, it's called ribbon shirts. They look a little bit like this. They just have ribbons on them, usually both horizontal and like attached vertically. So they kind of hang and move with you. Usually the fabric used in the shirt is a calico, which is not a cat. It is a floral or natural pattern, repeating pattern. Um, so that's, so this is one article of clothing that I associate with native people. The other one is the other, another article of clothing I associate with native people are army fatigues or military wear and camouflage, the pattern camouflage. Um, I thought that that happened. I thought that 
it was Mohawk people who started wearing camouflage during the Oak crisis of 1990. But um, I realized doing a little bit of research, just a little tiny bit that no, actually uh, at all kinds of confrontations between indigenous people and government forces, I should say colonial government forces, um, you can see indigenous people wearing um, army clothes, uh, military clothing. And of course, a lot of people will know that a lot of indigenous people have participated in US and Canadian armed forces. So I just thought a very simple idea, why don't we switch it up? Why don't we have um, ribbon shirts made with camouflage and uh, army pants made with calico? And so I just made, I just designed uh, again, like all this work that I've been doing, I, I could not have made it without amazing, brilliant students. So please read all the credits <laughs> of all my machinimas because all these people helped me make this stuff look so great. Um, so they helped me to, to design this uh, fabric um, designed a new calico, designed these camouflages with like this little flower that I used to doodle all the time and um, chose the colors, chose these four colors that I thought were significant, you know, olive green, powerful pink, steel blue, and gunmetal gray. And then I was, as I was, so basically, so I'm thinking, what is this, what is this for? Well, it's resistance wear. It's to wear to sh where to the demonstration, what to wear to the demonstration. It's to where to show that we are still here and we intend to remain here and we're ready to fight. And so it just made sense that each of them should have a protest sign too. And then I made the uh, machinima that I thought I was gonna make and it was terribly boring. It was like, it was no good. <laughs> I couldn't put it out in the world. Um, and so, I was like, okay, okay, I'm not sure exactly what I'll do. And it just seemed like, oh, now what do I do? And then it, you know, in the movie version, oh, an email would come <laughs> and you would, it was a call from Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto 2020. And they were like, we're, you know, apply to be in Indigenous Fashion Week's runway show. And I was like, oh my God. I'm not, these are just shirts and pants. I can make shirts and pants. We can make these in real life and we can, maybe they could be in the actual runway show. And so, um, so I'm skipping a thing. So anyway, I applied and I got in and I, I got to do that. And so I spent most of my first COVID home at home time sewing to make uh, stuff for the runway show that got not canceled, but transformed by COVID. But in the meantime, I also thought, hey, you know, why don't we try printing? I was invited to show my work in a shopping mall, <laughs> like, there's this really wonderful festival called Art Souterrain or Underground Art. And some people might know that Montreal is known as an underground city because it's so freezing cold that there's all these connecting paths everywhere. So there's this really cool art festival that asks uh, artists to, to put, put art in, the, in these passageways and in these areas. So I got to be one of them. And I, I inquired and found out that I could print these avatars onto a kind of vinyl. This is actually a an eco vinyl, it's not a petroleum product, just for if for people want to know, you know, when you can, you try to do these things. And um, yeah, so there, there they are. L'Avenir et Tartacton is the future is indigenous in French. We of course have a lot of uh, Francophone people in this country, in this city. L'Oe la vie, l'Ose la vie is water is life. Oh yeah, and this is my punchline. Here is the real people <laughs> dressed up in the real outfits. So they came to life and there are their, their signs on the bottom there. And I'm just about to have a show here in Montreal coming up that will mix the two. I'm going to have printed avatars stuck on the wall. I'm going to have mannequins wearing these clothes and I'm gonna hope that it looks like a demonstration. And that is it. Yamagoa everyone, thank you. Yay, that was so amazing. Thank you so much. And let's, um, we have a half an hour for questions. So I'm just going to remind the audience to please uh, type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we would love to hear your questions and I'll just start with a couple. So of course, uh, everyone's going to wonder, and I asked you before we began tonight, is the Calico and Camouflage collection available for purchase? 
and go ahead and tell the audience your 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 just your sad answer uh sad for <laughs> us well i'm not you know selling it as a clothing line i mean i made it as artwork and i think it's I think um, you can buy it um, and you can wear it, but it's I'm selling it at art prices. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's but, uh, uh, the, the other thing I said was that if somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm gonna give you all this money and all you gotta do is let me, <laughs> let me make your outfits, I would say, yes, you can give me all the money and you can make the outfits. Cause I would love to see people wearing this stuff. But you know, I made them and oh my God, they took a long time to make. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I printed the fabric, everything's like completely custom, you know, printed the fabric, um, like meaning, yeah, had their tiny batches, like enough to make one shirt, one pair of pants, uh, each of the colors. So yeah, that's, that's, I sort of think of them as artworks. Okay, well, we have a great uh, audience here tonight, more than a hundred people. So, and many of them very creative and well-connected um, in different <laughs> networks. So audience, that is a challenge to you. <laughs> about who you know that could invest in uh, Scalinati's fashion line and make Calico and Camouflage her first season of clothes that we could all uh, purchase and wear around. Um, okay, great, email us and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get in touch with the designer. I, you know, it has a built-in market because Vogue already featured this line. So uh, the number one fashion, um, you know, media, a journalist unit in the world already promoted it. So it's a good investment, those of you that can make this happen. And I'm gonna ask you about the role of fashion and art and luxury and um, wealth and success. You know, I read it in, I'm especially thinking of Time Traveler TM, although I think a lot of your work sort of implicitly has indigenous people in the future enjoying fabulosity in very material and wonderful ways. But Time Traveler TM particularly has this moment when the main female lead uh, character, um, Karakohawi, goes to a future powwow and sees, you know, that like the main prize for the jingle dance competition is two luxury sports cars. There's like a super famous indigenous band that's playing. There's a really famous indigenous supermodel walking down and there's just like a lot of money and a lot of like, you know, material wealth. And then at the end, she um, gets together with Hunter, you know, moves to the future permanently. And they inhabit this gorgeous penthouse apartment that he buys with his winning the time traveler contest. And I think she lives in your gallery, kind of, right? She lives in Abtec. Like she has all this wonderful indigenous art on her walls. And one of the female guests says, oh, I hear she's an expert at 21st century indigenous art. Like, you know, she, it's, it's the period she's from. And so she like collects, um, she's like a, she's like a well-known art collector now. And I just wanted to ask you about what, I mean, I think that statement, first of all, on the face of it is just that, of course, indigenous peoples deserve to enjoy um, amazing material wealth as much as anybody does, but is there a deeper statement or you know, another statement you're trying to make? Is it funny? Is it kind of like a wry commentary on how indigeneity is associated with poverty or or with sort of like ecological austerity in a way, you know, that indigeneity as a philosophy is about giving up on the idea of capitalist material success and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, so long answer. <laughs> first, first answer is Wab Canoe's line in his song, I'm going to live real lavish for all the times you call my people savage. Mm. So that's what I was thinking of when I made that episode. But I am also not thrilled by what capitalism has done to the planet and, our, and all our people, the people, all of us, not just one color or race, right? We're, we're mostly not doing so great under capitalism and um you know so i didn't um so in so i'm not always showing 
exactly the world that I want when I'm showing the future. I wanted to show different futures. This, you know, that episode and most of the episodes I was aiming for under 10 minutes long. And, you know, Native people, like you said, were so often stereotyped that, yeah, like that's another kind of authenticity. You have to be poor. If you're really Native, you're poor, you know? And I, I wanted to fight against that. So I just, I did treat, you know how I was saying, keep it simple, stupid. I did not do that with Time Traveler TM. I was like, this is gonna be the only artwork I ever make. I need to put all my ideas in here. <laughs> so like, I got Native people in love because we never see Native people in love. I right. wanted to show Hunter, Hunter, this is what's happening in Time Traveler TM, okay? We're, go we're taking Hunter, Hunter is, um, is allegory the right word? I'm having a moment. He represents native people. And his arc is our, our arc. Where we start, I start him off at a place where I feel like I give it maybe the 50s, the six, maybe the 50s, okay? Where it looks like all the projects of assimilation and genocide, thank you for using that word earlier, we're gonna work, okay? Because that's what, that's what both the governments, at least of Canada and British government and United States, that's what they were really trying to do, okay, is get rid of us. And, um, but I think in the 60s, and I think in large part due to and thanks to the civil rights movement, Native people also got their groove back. Native people also said, why do I want to, why do I want to be Native? And they remembered who they were. And that's what happens to Hunter, right? When he's when he's playing with his edutainment system, he's remembering, he's, he's understanding who we were and why we were so great and why we don't want to give up our indigeneity. And so, and then, so, but I start him off, if you, he, you heard that part where he's like, he's a freaking gun for hire. He's l the worst, right? And he's in a, he lives in a, a storage locker. You know, he can't get a job. He's like, I wanted to show him as like, not only like, I just want to show him as a failure, like not doing well at all, you know? Because I wanted to show him come to success. And then I just decided that success would be love of himself, love of another person and rich and famous <laughs> because we just don't see enough rich and famous people, native people. And also it is, it is a kind of success. Um, in real life, but also, again, uh, if you're using sort of shortcuts, like in short stories, you know, it's, a, it's an easy signifier. It was an easy way to show mm. success, you know, to just say lots and lots of money, you know, and fame. Mm. And so I, and you know, and it's very clear. And so I, I really just wanted that to be quite clear. I want it to be a clear success. That's so great. You know, I, do, I don't think of Hunter as a failure at the beginning of Time Traveler TM because although everything that you're saying makes perfect sense, but in a way, ev a lot of US media heroes are just like him. They are former military, action oriented. You know, he goes, he's looking for violence. He's looking for a fight at the beginning of the piece. And so, you know, it's just horrifying how uh, we have, you have to remind us that's a failed <laughs> state of being human. Like when you're in search of violence for your uh, entertainment, you know, like he changes over the course of, um, of all of his time travels. And I love that you called him an allegory and then his very wealth is an allegory also. It's a symbol of um, him finding fulfillment, which is, which is so great. Uh, and usually capitalist culture confuses that and thinks that they will find wealth and then find fulfillment. So they, they get that part of it backwards. All right, this leads great uh, in a really great way to a question that one of my students is asking, did the intention or goal of your machinima pieces, you know, does your intention and goal come first or do you evolve, the, do you find the intention as you work with the, you know, as you, as you develop the machinima? Well, it depends on the part. So the part you, the answer is it comes before the machinima gets made because I write everything first. So I write this. So the first thing I do is I just, I, I write this story and I just like 
pour out any, it's just writing, writing, writing. It doesn't necessarily have dialogue. It's like, it is ideas and it's character design and it's all the things at the same time. It is, it's a, it's a story. It is usually in the form, a prose form of story. Um, and that's where, but yeah, I guess like, I definitely, I know what I'm trying to do. Like in The Peacemaker Returns, I knew that what I really, I wanted to tell the peacemaker story, but I wanted, I really wanted to think about how the peacemaker story could apply to us today and in the future. And so I, I, I was working towards that in my writing. And then I go through many, many iterations at that stage. And, I, and once I've um, gotten something pretty good, then I turn it into a script. So that's when I take out the, the dialogue, when I pull out what's gonna be said by a character, for example, when I realize, oh, I can't show that thought, you know, in a thought bubble, I'm gonna need to have action <laughs> that shows what they're thinking or how they're feeling. And so that's when that part gets developed. And then, um, that's, then that's when I start to really talk about having a machinima. And so I start to um, draw the characters uh, in my, you know, in a, in, a, in a sketchbook. Anyway, I won't show you a picture right now, but like, I'll just draw a character and like, and my drawing is not very good, you know, but it's like sort of mostly kind of stick figure-y, but like they might have a, I think, okay, they need a beard or like, I really wanted Hunter to have a, a mohawk, you know, or something like a mohawk. And I really, I knew how I wanted him to look and I'll write notes, you know, how he should look. And then my team starts to work on that. So, and I and I, I say, well, he lives in a storage locker apartment and he has a weapons wall. So the team starts to make that storage locker apartment and the weapons wall. And it might be that I'm not 100% finished the story, but mostly I, I have to be because too many decisions get made from that story. So I've got the story, they're working. The next thing I do is I look, for, I'm sort of answering more of the question than you asked, but <laughs> the next thing I do is I, I look for voice talent, okay? And so I have been looking always in my, from my community. So I don't necessarily go for um, um, professional actors. I go for the people in the theater group or I have a lot of, had a lot of people from our radio station um, come and, and be, uh, be voice talent in my movies. Um, may, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, well, we have a very particular accent where I'm from. I don't really have it, but you can hear it in some of the Time Traveler, especially the Time Traveler TM episodes. But also I really wanted, like you could hear the mom talking, I really need people who can pronounce Mohawk names. And so I really uh, look for that. And yeah, and so I work with them and then I, I uh, record their voices. And only, only once I've recorded their voices do I shoot the machinima because you can get the avatars to kind of sync their mouths to it. The first episode of Time Traveler, well, first when I made that first episode, there was no mouth syncing. So it was gonna all be narration. And all, during making that first episode, they changed it. They started the mouths moving. And that's why you see that one, there's one zoom in on his, on his face when he says, ha ha, or I can't remember what he says. He's like, <laughs> Time Traveler TM on, that's what he says, you know? But the funny thing is actually I recorded me saying that, like we had me, I said that all his lines. And then I had the actor, my brother, come in and do the lines from that first episode. And it was terrible because none of the lines matched. He didn't say it the way I had said it. So we learned that we had to do the recording first. So yeah, so not, so most of the concepts are in place before we, you know, when we start filming. Having said that, there are definitely things that happen in the filming sometime that I'm like, that's awesome. We got to keep that. Like, you know, little accidents or angles or, you know, things you realize when you see it in front of you. Like there's this one moment also in Time Traveler TM when they're like, they're looking at each other and just, just that pause of them looking at so there's no dialogue, it wasn't written in there, but there's so much meaning in that image. And so like, you know, he says, I think he says, um, I already got more than what I came, I got what I came here for and then some, and he just looks at Garako Howie and you realize like, he loves her. Like he got love out of this, you know? So stuff like that happens. Great. Oh, I love that. I love that you let the, the machinima characters speak to you. 
um, and sort of like the way that actors have little accidental gestures and stuff too when you're when you're shooting a television um, episode or movie. That's so great. Um, the agency of the avatars. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, another process question from Professor Ann Walsh. All of the work is so wonderful. Uh, I wanted to uh, know about what your options are when you model bodies in Second Life and if the options available feel constraining or if they're what you want your characters to look like physically. So yeah, the bodies in Second Life, so you get a default, you get a default body you also now can get all kinds of bodies. You can, you buy bodies, but they are, they are, yeah, both the ones you buy and the ones you can, you can kind of, uh, the default ones that you can kind of shape a little, they're always these superhero bodies and these sexy, sexy bodies. Um, I have made my peace with it. Like, you know, I, I realized that what I was more, I was more interested in, changing some of the things that I could change more easily than the bodies. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I had to choose my battle and that was the battle I decided to leave behind of the, the different shapes of bodies. Having said that, I said that already before, but um, you know, so there is a new piece that I'm creating and, um, and I felt it was very important that the women's bodies were different shapes I'm going to be depicting the three sisters that are sustenance corn. They represent the three sisters are this. How do I say this? I'm going to have to learn how to say this better. But <laughs> they're this metaphor uh, personification of corn, beans, and squash, which is our sustenance, our main food that we depended on. I guess our my people, my ancestors depended on. And you know, I really wanted them to have different bodies, like for so many reasons, like because they're supposed to be corn, beans, and squash. I wanted one to be very voluptuous, one to be skinny like a bean pole, you know, and one to be, um, I guess, in, you know, corn light or the me medium, whatever. Uh, and so, the way we figured out how to do that, um, like it is possible to do. It's just I don't have that uh, skill in my tool, in my tool set, or in my my resource, my resources as part of my. Uh, team skills. So, um, but we, yeah, we were able to create an outfit. We could create an outfit and change that outfit and then put an alpha layer on the body so that we can now have a thin, you know, have these three different body shapes for them. Mm -hmm. So th this was where, and it, and it took a long time. It took mm -hmm. a lot, it took a lot of time. I pay my, all my students are paid by the hour. So it was a pretty, it was pretty expensive for me to do that, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was important in this piece, very important. In the other pieces, I don't, I'm okay. I'm okay with it not, um, not being more lifelike. Age is also hard to do in Second Life, but people, you know, the more people use it and the more people um, make things, the more things become available to everyone to use. So it's, it's happening, but it's, it's pretty slow. I think people really like the sexy Barbie bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I notice in Time Traveler TM, age is really indicated by the by the voice actor, which seems to work really great. You know, the the body doesn't have to totally match the the voice. The voice indicates to you who that person is. So I think that works really well. Um, we have a question from Kristen who asks, "Can you talk more about the work you and your partner are doing around indigenizing uh, programming or creating indigenous programming languages?" I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I feel I'm not as good at it as, as he is, Jason Lewis, who I, I think I've mentioned his name already, I hope. Jason, Jason, Jason Lewis, Jason Edward Lewis. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's so wonderful. When we went to Hawaii, we, um, of course, we met a lot of language speakers. Uh, many of the participants in the, in the, we did two workshops there actually, and many of the participants there were, were learning the language or were speakers already. And, uh, and they, and, there was also, a, for the first time, like a pretty sizable group of programmers in the mix. And they were so interested in starting um, an, an Olelo Hawaii programming group. And they did that. And so um, I don't re know where it ended up or if it even has ended, but I believe they worked for a year. At first, they were just, I'm so sorry. Um, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I'm, I'm actually not going to say which language they were translating but i'm pretty sure they were they took this the structure of a certain programming language like maybe it was c plus plus but i don't remember i'm sorry 
and they and they decide to use that structure, but with all Olelo Hawaii words. Uh, so that's one thing. And um, also another thing, uh, uh, an indigenous tech, I think, and is that he's working on is, um, or actually, sorry, he's not quite doing the tech yet. He's actually laying the groundwork though by, he's written an amazing article along with four, three other indigenous thinkers called Making Kin with the Machines. And it's about indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence. And if you're interested in, uh, in indigenous tech and in how indigenous philosophy and culture can affect technology and perhaps improve it, take a look at that article. Oh my gosh, somebody please post a link to that article in chat. I'm sure many of us on this uh, in this webinar are gonna teach that you know, next semester. Uh, okay, a question from Dua. How does indigenous futurism interact with Afrofuturism in your opinion? And we also just had a, the fabulous video artist, uh, Lawrence Leck speak in uh, Berkeley Center for New Media and he was talking about Gulf futurism also. And he has coined this term Sinofuturism. Um, too. So there are these different orientations towards futurity um, that have to do with ethnicity or that have to do with um, regionalism or, or nationality. So yeah, what is your, um, what is, how do you see the interaction of these different futurisms? Well, this, this is the interaction, right? We're in this together. Okay. Excellent. We need to help each other. We are, it was our labor and our land that made this land, this place, uh, what it is <laughs> for good, for better and for worse. But I think, um, you know, I think Afrofuturism to me, to me, indigenous uh, futurism and Afrofuturism are super similar because indigenous futurism is really about maintaining that link to the past and bringing it into the future. And I think, um, I feel that that's similar in Afrofuturism. Um, I feel like we have a lot to learn from Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism has been happening for so long, like decades at this point, especially, you know. And um, so that's, that's my answer. I mean, it's just like Afrofuturism is awesome and we wanna be just as awesome. We're, we're trying, we're like following in your footsteps. Thank you for being Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism. You're awesome. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, all right. And I love that you showed, can you hold up the, the art piece? Uh, one and, more oh time? my God, I have to find her name. It's, I can't remember her name. I'm the worst. I will like, I'll find her name. Wait a minute. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you for showing us that great art piece one more time. Fabulous and inspiring. Um, uh, I wish I, we could put those jackets into the fashion line <laughs> that you're that you're sure to create with the help of um, intrepid Berkeley students. Okay, uh, I, this is more of a comment, but I just wanted to pass on a comment from Ren, who says, um, I'm incredibly impressed with what you were able to accomplish in the student workshop in Hawaii in such a short amount of time, extraordinary. And uh, I was thinking about that workshop as, oh, what's that? This is oh, her. That's the artist. That's the artist, okay. okay. Thank on Instagram. You. Okay. She's awesome. Kalua Howie. Kalua, I'm so sorry. Kalua Howie, Jocelyn, and Howie. Oh, yeah, I might cool. be saying her name wrong, but you can. <laughs> they eventually, you at the end, of, I'll, I'll look at the chat at the end during the outro. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fantastic. I can't see right now. So I was I was thinking about the the Hawaii project and education as a uh, as you were saying as the you know as indigenous futurism focusing on youth and education is a form of indigenous futurism and so is sci-fi you know in putting indigenous people into futuristic narratives and linking time travel and new media works that are retellings of legends and also uh, new media works that tell contemporary indigenous stories. So there are many kinds of indigenous futurism that you deal with. I just wanted to ask where you think uh, indigenous futurism is going, you know, what is the future of the type of futurism that you work in? Um, and also our student Anna Maria asks, um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're a student, but Anna Maria asks, you know, what are the new media or the new type of art that you're going towards? Well, 
thank you for asking that question and for helping me because I don't know what the future of indigenous futurism, but I know what my future is. I think I'm like, I think I'm slowly gonna back out of, um, I can't even believe I'm saying this. I, I like still love Second Life, right? Like it's like people watch it and are like, oh, it's so, ooh, oh, but you know, actually COVID-19 has really boosted Second Life a lot. People are back in world a lot. Um, but uh, I'm, I do feel that there's actually a pretty narrow, like people, it does not reach everyone. When people look at my machinimas, a lot of times they don't know what they're looking at. A lot of people don't, and it, I mean, and it's okay, I understand. I mean, like even in this tonight, like people don't know what I have control over or what I don't. Am I trying to say something with these sexy bodies or do we have to, you know, what, what does that mean? Like, why are their faces making these horrible expressions? You know, like, <laughs> There's a lot of questions, like there's a lot of things that you can't, that people don't um, understand. And it's, and I know, I mean, it's, it's very hard for them to understand because they don't know the technology. And that's, I get that. I'm not, I wouldn't, I don't fault any people looking at it and not understanding it, like, because it's so idiosyncratic, you know? And so, um, and so I, I think that's, even though I, I do love working and I, and I think I won't, I say I won't stop until they stop making Second Life, but um, making clothing has really been exciting because, you know, people look at clothing and they understand it immediately. And clothing uh, is so political, actually, right? I mean, what we wear, we wearing it, we, we talk about who we are by, by what the clothes we wear. We don't have to say anything. It expresses who we are. If we choose not to wear clothes, that's a political statement, you know? I mean, there's, there's, it's so interesting and rich, you know? And I think, um, I think that's where I'm headed uh, with, that's where I would like to go is think about, think about clothing. And I don't know if it's fashion or costume, I'm shy to say fashion, you know, that I'm a fashion designer. I don't, I don't feel that I'm a fashion designer, but I do think that, that, you know, I've been thinking, what I've been thinking about all this time is self-representation. How do indigenous people represent themselves in cyberspace? Why do we represent ourselves, you know? And, and I think that there's, you know, why not just go, why say, why stop at cyberspace? How do we represent ourselves? How do indigenous people represent ourselves? And why not, you know, think about that more? So that's what I, I think might be my future. And um, I'm working on a long timeline though. I go very slowly, <laughs> you know, I try, you know, I do, I've got two more machinimas in me for sure. Three actually, maybe four. I like, there's like all these ideas I still want to do in there. Um, and um, so, you know, and then, and I just think like, I'll make, co I'm making costumes, like I'm making the, the three sisters, I'm showing them as like superheroes, you know? So I'm, we're designing these superhero costumes for them. And I think it'd be so amazing to make those costumes in real life when we're done. Oh yeah, for sure. That would be amazing. Or even, um, or even everyday fashion that drew, that draws on those costumes too, and makes them sort of wearable for everyday life. You can that's see, I'm really, I'm really pushing for, for that. I'm really, that's my main agenda with this Q and A. I'm kind uh, of, I'm, it's, that's, I'm not used to it, but I think I could like it. I think I could get used to it, I mean. Yes, let me remind you, you are in vogue. So I, I sort of question <laughs> if you're not a fashion designer. I think you are. Okay, just one more question. We'll, we're just gonna go a little bit over time because we did drop out a couple of minutes from the middle of the talk. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the liberty to ask one more question from Catherine. I'm sorry to everyone whose question I wasn't able to get to. Um, Catherine asks, do you ever worry about using heritage um, like the belts or other direct image references or practices that come from your indigenous ancestors in your future, in your future sci-fi works? Are there ways that you must be careful? Um, I think asking about, you know, how much do you, I mean, maybe I'm, in, I'm interpreting too much, but how much do you have to respect tradition or think about um, authenticity uh, when you when you're putting wampum belts into your machinima, mm -hmm. yes, that's that's a great question. Um, I try to be. How can I tell you? I feel really lucky because I've been told that you are Mohawk and this is your culture and it's yours to do with what you want. 
That's what the people around me have told me. I know that there are other indigenous tribes uh, where permission is extremely important. It's extremely important that if you tell a story, that the, this story, some oftentimes that story belongs to a certain uh, family and you need permission to, to tell the story. Um, I still, not, so even though I ha have been told that, I do, con I am concerned. I'm very concerned about um, depicting something in a way that people uh, will disagree with. Um, and so what I do, um, but I take responsibility I, and sometimes I choose to do it anyway. And so what I do is I have certain people that I ask, I have, you know, I, I don't usually call them elders, but they're older than me. They're, they're very uh, knowledgeable about our culture. They're very opinionated about our indigeneity. Uh, and so I, I have formulated this question. Do you think it would be offensive if I did this? Do you think it would be offensive if I showed Sky Woman as an alien? Or can you please read my script? Is there anything in there that offends you? That's what I have done. And so, um, and so I get their responses and, um, and sometimes I take their advice. And sometimes, one time, they told me to change something which you would not believe, which is very surprising, which is in She Falls for Ages. So most times when you hear the creation story, the last animal, the one, the animal that does get the, the water animal that does get the earth and brings it to her, that's usually the muskrat. And that's what I had in my script. And the person I was consulting with, they were like, I know it always says the muskrat, but I think it's the otter. And I'm going to <laughs> And I'm gonna tell you why. And she told me why. And I decided to do it. And I feel afraid sometimes when I show that. Not really afraid, you know, but you know, there might be somebody out there, some traditional person or some elder who says to me, you made a big mistake. It's not right for you to change a story, you know? Mm. Um, and I'll tell them why I did it. And I, I feel I have a good reason. But, uh, you know, I took a chance and, um, and, I, and, you know, that's, and that's why I put my name on it. It's not just for the glory. You got to take the blame. You know, like sometimes people are going to come after you. <laughs> and you got, you know, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Scalinati, for joining us this evening. I know everybody at home is also applauding as I am. That was so fantastic. Thank you for sharing your beautiful art, your energy, your wisdom with us. Uh, Goa, it was a total pleasure. It was that you are an amazing moderator. Thank you for your wonderful enthusiasm. And uh, I, I hope I get to see the chat. I lost the chat when my computer, whatever happened there. So I'm hoping that someone has that and I'd love to, um, I'd love to see that. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Hola.